Hello everyone. Um, first of all, a slight apology. My uh, co-author and um, former friend who promised to be here today to answer all of the complicated genetics questions got a better offer and has gone to a conference in Singapore. So uh, you know, there we are, what can you do? Um, what we really wanted to do with this talk was start to think about how we could use genetic strands of data to try and sort of address, I suppose, what we would traditionally think of as archaeological questions or behavioural questions. And it really sort of came from a, a background of conversations about the way diseases impacted on uh, past populations, hominin populations, sort of before the first epi epidemiologic transition time frame. Um, so what we sort of increasingly see from the uh, ancient DNA data strands, um, the high quality Altai Neanderthal, oh, sorry, the high quality Altai Neanderthal um, and Denisovan genomes, is what regions of archaic hominin DNA have, uh, have been preserved or we find in Homo sapiens, I should say. And a number of these sort of sections of DNA are associated with a response to infection and immunity. Um, with the suggestion, really, that some of these derived, alle uh, derived Neanderthal alleles that are found in modern European and Asian populations uh, may be associated with autoimmunity. So the Neanderthal and Denisovans provide a case study, really, of a hunter-gatherer hominin population uh, adapted to Eurasian rather than African infectious disease packages, which in turn gives us an interesting way to start to think about uh, how disease and infectious disease packages would have impacted on, uh, on, on, on Neanderthal and indeed Homo sapien European hunter-gatherer populations. And what really got us, uh, got us thinking about this was the idea of, oops, sorry, click, there we go. Um, uh, this, uh, 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 just to sort of really say, it's, it's this idea of the first epidemiological transition, the first shift, where's the laser pointer, sorry, is that a pointer? Yeah. Thanks. This idea is almost a, an invincible caveman, you know, this idea that we still have today of a, of a, of a paleolithic diet. It's quite a, an idea that sort of impacts quite widely in the public imagination, and it really can trace all of its roots back to a, a seminal paper, which has turned into one of the most citable events, or the most citable papers that we find in in sort of epidemiology, epidemiology and when we're thinking about paleopathology, and I'm sure everybody is familiar with the paper that is uh, uh, The Epidemiological Transition, A Theory of Epidemiology and Population Change by Omran, 1971. And to be fair, this is really part of a much wider, or his paper was part of a much wider consideration of not just population demographic, but also uh, fertility patterns and sort of change of populations in the post in the past and in a, in a modern context. But what we kind of have done in sort of the archaeological world is seize upon one or two central parts of the paper and to sort of apply it backwards. So essentially what we have with uh, the first epidemiological transition from Omran's paper is this idea that hunter-gatherer populations were largely free from the, the worst excesses, shall we say, of infectious disease. And this is an idea that really has sort of taken hold. If we jump forward and we look at the paper from 2005 by um, uh, George Armilegos et al., evolutionary historical and particularly in the economic perspectives on health and disease, we're still seeing the same ideas about what it was like to, uh, uh, to be a hunter-gatherer population before the Holocene and what was the role of infectious diseases. So the next slide, uh, this is a direct quote from the paper, I've just chopped it up to make it slightly easier to read on the slide. Small population sizes would have precluded infectious diseases having major evolutionary impacts. That's particularly significant, as well as, as, I, as we would like to suggest. Deadly diseases would soon run their course as the small number of susceptible individuals was infected. And lastly, paleolithic populations lacked the common and deadly communicable diseases, such as influenza, measles, mumps and smallpox. So, if we go back to the, to the term that Omran used, which was pestilences, the general consensus or the general thinking is that hunter-gatherer populations in a Pleistocene context were largely free from the, from the worst impacts of these pestilences. That's not to say, of course, there weren't infectious diseases, but essentially the impact of them was not great. And therefore, you would not expect to see any particularly strong selective pressures for, that, for, for resistance to these infectious diseases. Um, so in other words, what we really have is... Uh, the vast majority of infectious diseases or, path or uh, 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 pathogens entering uh, human contexts after domestication of animals in the Holocene. So when we first start to see pastoralism, we either have a crossover from domesticated or peri-domesticated animals. And this is really one of those sort of incredible paradigms or orthodoxies which has hung around and stuck for a long, long time. Um, I'm always reminded of Francis Bacon's idea, sort of 16, what was uh, Novorum or Gorum, 1620. One of the greatest bars to, uh, to knowledge is just doing things because that's the way we've always done them. And I think it, it, 
now we're having these extra strands of data coming online, especially from the genomics, it's, it's well worth thinking about how these data sets can impact on our, our thinking about what was the role of disease in the past. Um, so essentially we have four extra data strands we can play with now, represented uh, rather badly by my pictures. So you can think really that we're into a, 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 a post just bones and stones environment if you want. So essentially we have these four extra data strands. We have the ancient DNA from the Neanderthals themselves, which shows us which infectious diseases they would have been adapted to. We have human, the human genome, where we have uh, adaptive integration um, uh, as independent evidence of which diseases were important for anatomically modern humans, especially moving into Europe and presumably interacting with the Neanderthals. We can look at the role of um, uh, the pathogens themselves. This is uh, the genome of uh, Yersinia pestis, purely for visual purposes, not suggesting that was a, a Pleistocene disease that was impacting uh, the Neanderthals. Um, and we also have um, the role of intersubspecies exchange of pathogens. Okay, that's represented by the picture that we've, we've seen several times uh, over the last couple of days. The idea that we have the passage of genetic material between Denisovans, Neanderthals and humans gives us a, 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 an interesting uh, uh, environment in which to consider the role of infectious pathogens. So what we wanted to do then was use these data strands to really think about this idea of an, epi an epidemiologic shift that is supposed to have taken place during the Holocene. So essentially what we want to look at is how did infectious disease impact uh, on the Pleistocene hominins, and did the first epidemiological transition actually represent a, a, a real seismic shift with the introduction of a new disease package or a new package of infectious diseases, or was it really just a, sh a change in the, in the patterning and impact of uh, pre-existing pathogens that we already see uh, a selection for protection against in, in, in ancient genomes? If we do a, a very simple uh, analysis of uh, disease packages and compare between the Holocene and the Pleistocene, the pattern is rather suggestive. Um, this, uh, the tables that I'm going to show, one for bacterial packages, one for viral packages, and one for, inf uh, one for um, 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 bacterial, viral, and uh, 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 parasitic packages, um, these are based on the, um, the, heirloom, the heirloom pathogens, which are the ones that have been present in the primates, so they've been there all the way through, but also ones where we have independent genomic evidence for the pathogens themselves, so it's when we can actually come up with a, a, a decent phylogenetic date to show that they're post-Holocene. And what we see when we look at the, ba the, look at the, uh, the bacterial load is a number of sort of very common and uh, relatively serious uh, uh, bacterial uh, infectious diseases. Um, I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on this list, but suffice to say, things that really would have caused problems we find in these uh, we find in the uh, in, 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 in the bacterial package. If we look at the parasitic package, uh, head, head lice and body lice, uh, fantastic paper f several years ago now, wasn't it? Looking at the uh, the divergent states between uh, uh, body lice shows that we see a real change in uh, uh, in how these things have been impacting. And again, the differentiation between the Holocene and the, and the Pleistocene might seem quite slight. But as I'll come back to in a, 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 a little bit later, when we look at some of these guys and look at some of the way these things are impacting on people in the past, these are the ones, the first episode, first, I might just call it the FET if that's all right with everyone, because I'm going to trip over first epidemiological transition every time. The, uh, the FET would predict that we don't see any great impact of certainly parasites until we have larger populations, until we have sedentary behaviour, until we have large-scale um, uh, uh, interaction with animals. And uh, just lastly, to look at the viral packages, again, we see a very large number of, of Pleistocene viral packages, Holocene viral packages, but again, with the exception of things like HIV and hepatitis and influenza and measles, we're not really seeing too much of a differentiation between these two. Um, Pathogens, of course, would have been of, uh, of, of particular importance or interest to the Neanderthals themselves. Uh, they would have been uh, uh, something the Neanderthals had to ba battle against, as I, as, as, as I, perhaps that's a slightly better way of putting it. And uh, a paper by Kuhn et al. in 2009, of course, suggested that there was evidence in a rock shelter of anatomically modern humans burning their bedding, presumably to remove parasites from, uh, from uh, par contaminated parasites on their bedding. Um, if it was happening to anatomically modern humans in Europe, it's a reasonable assumption that that would have also been something which would have impacted on the Neanderthals as, as well. And to go back to the FET model, thanks. To go back to the FET model, we need to remember, of course, that this isn't something we're expecting to be seeing at the time. Um, let me skip on a tiny bit. Um, 
Sorry, I'm just jumping ahead slightly. I'm rabbiting far, far too much academic disease. Um, uh, sepsis is a really quite nice uh, example of this. Well, not nice if you have sepsis, of course. Um, uh, Sankaraman et al. scanned the genomes of European and, uh, and Asians for evidence of individual SNPs that have uh, introgressed from the Neanderthals. A number of these SNPs are associated with uh, immunity and autoimmunity in modern humans. One of the really quite interesting ones was ILK18, or interleukin. It, it's a gene with the central role in, uh, in the innate immune response and development of bacterial sepsis. Um, essentially, IL18 induces interferon gammon, uh, which protects against infection. If you have too much of IL-18, um, it can be associated with an allergic response and quite severe development of sepsis. Um, the intragress SNP uh, of, 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 of IL-18, S, I've got it in my notes here because I'm not a geneticist, S1834481, is associated with decreased uh, production of serum levels. So essentially it's suggesting that the Neanderthals had a strong selective pressure acting to, uh, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to, to produce this. Um, something that presumably when coming into contact with Homo sapiens, it became beneficial in Europe, strong selective pressure to preserve it, etc. But of course, infection can be a two-way street. Um, although we have no direct evidence of genetic, uh, sorry, no direct evidence of transmission as yet, given the temporal and geographical overlap, and evidence of interbreeding, this is extremely likely. One of the things that uh, produces a particularly interesting pattern is when we look at the human herpes virus 8, or KSHV. Um, there's evidence of, uh, of African pathogen exchange between humans and other hominin species here. Um, it's preserved in the genome of human herpivirus 8, and there are three highly divergent forms of the KS15 gene, P, which is extremely common, M, which has a very low global frequency, and N, which is found only in, uh, only in South Africa. This is work by Hayward and Zong from 2005, uh, 2007. Pardon. Um, the highly divergent forms of M and N uh, integrest into humans uh, through recombination with another human, uh, 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 human simplex virus, not yet found in modern humans. But based on the divergence dates between uh, M and P, uh, which happened at around uh, 200 and 500,000 years ago, it suggests the presence of um, uh, uh, interaction with other hominin species. So essentially, what we have here is a fossil record of interaction between different hominin species preserved in the genomes of a pathogen. M was originally thought to be found in the Neanderthals, but given recent, uh, recent analysis of the genetics, it suggests that this actually took place much, much earlier in Africa from an unknown hominin, which, of course, if we ever get any dates for the rising star uh, fossils, means that we could look forward to a Daily Mail headline like this. Um, sorry, how am I for time? I've completely lost track of myself. How am I for time? Two minutes. Thanks ever so much. Right. Um, <laughs> Just to finish very briefly then with, uh, with another example, which is Heliobacter pylori. Um, again, this is a particularly interesting one. We know the first Homo sapiens infections took place around 88 to 116,000 years ago, based on work by Moody et al. in 2012, not found in pan species, um, and intriguingly absent from African hunter-gatherer groups until the last few hundred thousand years. Uh, that was worked by Nell et al. In, uh, in 2013. So the suggestion is this must have left during some of the out-of-Africa dispersal events. Um, and it's highly, unlike, sorry, it's highly likely that we would, we would have seen transmission between these disease packages when they came into contact with the Neanderthals. So just to sort of conclude, and uh, sorry for rushing slightly, um, what we're kind of suggesting is that models of epidemiological transition must continually develop in light, to, in light of new genetic data, which is something we argue they haven't really done up to, up to now. Multiple interbreeding events between at least three hominin species provide routes for pathogen exchange. Of course, we have the Neanderthals, we have Homo sapiens, and we have the Denisovans. For me, as a, a sort of a biological anthropologist, not a geneticist, the thing that I think is quite interesting is we can't use human behavioural patterns uh, as an ecological proxy to explain changes in, uh, in, 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 in the shifts between the co-evolutionary relationship between pathogens and human populations. So in other words, just the change to specialism can't really be used to change, can't really be used to explain what we're seeing with this, uh, with this change in disease package. And the impact of Homo sapiens pathogens post out of Africa may have contributed to the decrease of Neanderthal uh, populations in, in localised areas. So not going as far as to say, of course, it caused Neanderthal extinction, but of course it could have played a, a, a it could have had some form of role in um, in contributing to, to population collapse. Um, and again, for me, I think what this does is it, it, it helps to rehabilitate the Neanderthals slightly. If we're thinking about the Neanderthals suffering from the same types of diseases as us, 
not something that is purely post uh, post Holocene. It helps to take the Neanderthals from the, the, the sort of the old Hackney views and, and put them much more in the forefront of our thinking about you know them as another human species of hominin. And I'd just like to thank uh, uh, the various people, Rob Foley and Martin Lahr at Cambridge, for uh, for their help and comments. Uh, at the, uh, the Human Evolutionary Discussion Group. Um, funding was provided by King's College Cambridge and UCL. Um, really, really helpful comments from people on the BioArchive website um, and my daughter who insisted on helping with my slides this morning, which is why some of the formatting might have been slightly peculiar in places. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. So, uh, are there questions? Have your time for talking longer, you know. <laughs> now, any question? Yeah? Okay. Uh, where does there any evidence for brucellosis in the pre Holocene populations come from? Um, brucellosis, sorry, I have to come back to the microphone. Uh, there is evidence for brucellosis in pre-Holocene populations. Um, I'm sorry, I completely forgot the name of the paper, but there's some suggestion there's skeletal evidence in Australopithecus africanus. Uh, and when you look at the genomes of brucellosis, it has a much earlier divergence date. Uh, sorry, it has a much earlier split date. It, 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 it's present there in a form in the genetics and it's arguably present in the fossil record in, in, in Africanus. Uh, 